Doesn't that intro make you feel like we're about to go on an Indiana Jones adventure? <laughs> well, we're gonna. So get ready. Good morning, Greenville campus. My name is Tyson Hodge. I am the campus pastor uh, here at our Greenville campus. And this morning, I am preaching churchwide to far off places all around the world to places like the South Green campus <laughs> and the Afton campus, which are so far away. But I am glad to be up here and talking with you. Um, as Wesley already mentioned, we have Boca Raton Christian School with us. And so we are glad to have them. <laughs> The one time that I was in Boca Raton, Florida, I ate at this deli called Two J's, and I had the most amazing bowl of matzo ball soup. It, it, it obviously left an impact on me. When I heard they were coming, I'm like, we got to talk about matzo ball soup. So it was terrific. I need to get back there just to have some soup again. Uh, we are glad to be digging into Exodus chapter 5 this morning. So turn with me in your Bibles or in your Bible apps, and we are going to look at Exodus chapter 5. There are going to be some important themes that come up in this chapter, and the most important theme in the book of Exodus is going to rise to the surface. And in my opinion, the most important theme of the entire Bible, and that is the identity of God. And so when we study the Bible, yeah, we learn about Moses, and we learn about Abraham, and we learn about Ruth and Esther, and we learn about John and Peter and all these people, but throughout the entirety of the scriptures, we learn who God is. We learn who he is, his standards, his expectations of us, but we learn about God. And so that theme is preeminent in this chapter. And it might be a little under the surface, but I'm going to help pull it out. After Noah's flood in Genesis, we see several stories that help illustrate how the people of the earth turn away from God and they forget God. And so in the book of Exodus, we see God coming and reestablishing himself, reestablishing his identity. And so we see stories after the flood of Noah, like the Tower of Babel and other things, and we'll get to those questions soon enough. But all that to say is the title of my sermon is Who is the Lord? Who is the Lord? And we get these from the words from the mouth of Pharaoh right away, right away in our past scripture. When Moses and Aaron go before Pharaoh, these are the first words out of Pharaoh's mouth. He says, who is the Lord? And so that is the question that the book of Exodus continues to answer. It continues to answer that question, who is the Lord? And so Pharaoh meant it. He didn't care who the Lord was. He meant it in a dismissive way. Who is this God? But what's ironic is soon enough, Pharaoh would know. Soon enough. So open your Bibles. Exodus chapter 5. We are going to pray together, and then we are going to dig in. So pray with me. God, we need your word. We need it so that we can understand you. We need it so that in understanding you, we understand ourselves. And through your word, you show us who we are, who we need to be, and you provide change. And that's what we ask for this morning, that we would understand your word, that you would use it to change our hearts. Help me to speak clearly. Help me to speak efficiently to do your word justice and to bring you glory. Thank you, God. Amen. Chapter 5, verse 1. Afterward. Okay, pause. Pause. After what? After what? Well, right before this, Aaron and Moses, they go to the Hebrew people, and they get the elders together, and they say, hey, elders, this is everything that God has told us, everything that he said he will do, and they believe him, and they're on board, and they all worship together, showing that they are unified together in this. So after that, 
Afterward, Moses and Aaron went and said to Pharaoh, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Let my people go, that they may hold a feast to me in the wilderness. But Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord, that I should obey his voice and let Israel go? I do not know the Lord, and moreover, I will not let Israel go. And so the very first words out of Pharaoh's mouth, like I said, is dismissal. Dismissal of who this other God is. And this makes a lot more sense when taken into the context of Pharaoh's theology. Okay, So Egypt, as you probably know, had lots of gods that they believed in. And these different gods had different responsibilities, different territories. Some were more powerful than the others. And so I don't know if you remember ever seeing the the, the death mask of King Tut, of Tutankhamen, or Tutankhamen? Tutankhamen sounds more appropriate. So (laughs) you might have seen it, you might have not, but I brought it with me to show you, so let's take a look. Let's take a look at this mask. You can see at the top of his head, on his forehead, he's got these two snakes coming off of his head. And I don't know, you might have just seen that, like, oh, cool snakes. But this is actually a theological statement. So they believed that there was a God of the upper Nile and a God of the lower Nile. And the Nile is what brought the people life. They could not exist without the Nile. All right? So... Pharaoh and the Egyptians believed that these two main gods, these two high powerful gods, gave Pharaoh his commissioning, his power to be the king, to provide life for the people. And so the Egyptian people saw the Pharaoh as the, Egypt, as the image of these gods. And so Pharaoh saw himself. That way. So then when Moses shows up making demands on behalf of a God of some enslaved people group, of course he's going to dismiss them. What are you talking about? I'm God. I am the ones that the gods have put in power. You're obviously enslaved. You don't have much of a God. I'm not going to pay any attention. So let's keep going. Verse 3. Then they, Moses and Aaron, said, the God of the Hebrews has met with us. Please let us go a three days journey into the wilderness that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God, lest he fall upon us with pestilence or with the sword. So this is interesting. What is this three days journey business? I thought that this was a one-way trip. Like as in, they're going to go away for many days, not coming back. So is Moses lying here? Is he trying to deceive Pharaoh? Well, one thing is, is clear, is for sure. Moses is obeying the Lord. If we go back to chapter 3, we will see these are the exact words the Lord told Moses to tell to Pharaoh. Tell him the three-day journey. And so God is... Uh, I'm sorry, Moses is obeying God very, very clearly, using word for word what God told him. So then, therefore, is God lying? Is God deceiving? No. God is not deceiving. God is always good. God defines good. He cannot sin. And so here's what's going on. Here's how I interpret it. This is showing that God knows Pharaoh's heart completely. He knows that Pharaoh won't even do this little bit. Pharaoh will not let them go, even for this journey to worship, with implications that they would come back. Exodus 3 tells us this. God says to Moses, But I know the king of Egypt will not let you go unless compelled by a mighty hand. God knows the heart of Pharaoh is merciless is impossible, is hard. And so even this little request, in comparison to, hey, your entire slavery force is going to be gone forever, even this little request will be denied. And as a bonus note, modern archaeologists have found Egyptian records where slave owners did allow their slaves 
to go on a few days journey to worship their gods, to sacrifice to their gods, or to even care for dying or dead loved ones. Like it, it definitely wasn't a thing where it's like, hey, this slavery comes with a vacation package. No, like it, that wasn't a guaranteed thing. But it was common, it was common enough. And so Pharaoh wouldn't even do this, all right? Continuing on, verse four. But the king of Egypt said to them, Moses and Aaron, why do you take the people away from their work? Get back to your burdens. And Pharaoh said, behold, the people of the land are now many. This is an important word. We'll come back to it. Hold on to it in your head. The people of the land are now many, and you make them rest from their burdens. So what's going on with this word? Well, it's, it's a callback to Exodus chapter 1. There's actually going to be three callbacks. This is the first of three. But what's going on here is Moses, the author of this book, he's pointing out that this new Pharaoh, the, the later Pharaoh that he's standing in front of, has the same mindset as the previous Pharaoh. And so if we go back to Exodus chapter 1, it says this, eight, verses 8 and 9. Now there arose a new king over Egypt, who did not know Pharaoh. This is either the father or the grandfather of the Pharaoh from our passage. And he said to his people, Behold, the people of Israel are too many and too mighty for us. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them, lest they multiply. All right, so what is the purpose? Why does he want to deal shrewdly with them? He doesn't want them to multiply. He wants them to stay small. Pharaoh is convinced that he must keep the Hebrew people from multiplying. Whether he knows it or not, he is in direct opposition to God's created mandate. This is exactly what God told them to do. Be fruitful and multiply. Multiply. Fill the earth. But I'm not just building this idea from this one word. There are a couple more callbacks, and we will see this idea more filled out. Verse 6. The same day Pharaoh commanded the taskmasters of the people and their foremen. So let's pause just a second. Let's explain what's going on here. So we have Egyptian taskmasters who are over Hebrew foremen who are then being held accountable for all of the Hebrew people, okay? The same day, Pharaoh commanded the Egyptian taskmasters of the people of their foremen, you shall no longer give the people straw to make bricks. Another important word. We'll come back to it. As in the past. Let them go and gather straw for themselves. But the number of bricks that they made in the past, you shall impose on them. You shall by no means reduce it, for they are idle. Therefore they cry, let us go and offer sacrifices to our God. Let heavier work be laid on the men that they may labor at it and pay no regard to lying words. So here we see with the brick thing, we see the second callback to Exodus chapter one, focusing on the bricks. It's another literary cue. So before we keep going, let me put this idea in your head. You all understand what all goes into a nation's GDP. You understand what a nation produces. Egypt did not only make bricks. They raised crops where they could. They raised animals. They fished the Nile and the ocean. They had trades and services. They had metalworking. They had a military. They made bricks. And yes, maybe a lot of the slaves were brick makers, but that's not all the Hebrew slaves did. Earlier, we heard how the Egyptian people gave their burdens to the Hebrews. They did more than brick making. So then why is author Moses focusing on the brick making industry? Because of how bricks have already been presented in the scriptures. It has meaning. It has meaning. It's another callback to Exodus chapter 1, where that pharaoh was oppressing the Hebrews, and he did what? He gave them brick-making to do. It's another callback, another point of conflict with the creation mandate, which we'll talk a little bit more about. What other 
big event in the scriptures has bricks as a part of its story. Tower of Babel, who said that? Gold star. Gold star, there we go. Oh, it's my wife, she's smart. <laughs> hey, that's not fair, I want a gold star. Yeah. You gotta give the right answers, guys. So go back with me to this story mentally, okay? Go back with me to the Tower of Babel. Just before the Tower of Babel, Noah and his family gets off the boat, and God reestablishes the creation mandate with them. He says, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth. And so then what did this, the population eventually do? They say, no, we're going to stay here. We're going to build a tower. Let me read it for you. Genesis 11:2. And the people migrated from the east. They found a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. And they said to one another, Come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and bitumen or bitumen for mortar. Then they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens. And here it comes. Let us make a name for ourselves. That's why they're doing it. That's why they're building the city. That's why they're building the tower. Let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be dispersed over the face of the whole earth. So back to our passage here in the second callback, what author Moses is doing is saying that this Pharaoh, number one, he first was conflicting with God's mandate by saying, nope, you can't multiply. Nope, you can't be fruitful. Number two, he is wanting the glory for himself. He's saying, Moses, author Moses is saying that Pharaoh is just as self-idolizing as the people of the Tower of Babel, all right? And you might be thinking, come on, Tyson. You're building a lot of this case stuff on just like a couple words, a couple key phrases. Like it, it doesn't say that Pharaoh wanted his own glory or that he opposed the creation mandate. I think you might be making this up, putting too much on it. No, friends, this is how the Bible works. This is how the Bible works. It takes key words and key phrases and key ideas and key people from previous scriptures and says, okay, remember what you learned there? Bring it over here. We're going to apply it here. This is why I, I have the strong opinion that nobody should go to Revelation. Feel free to go and read it. Yeah, that's fine. But no one should go and like seriously try to interpret it unless they know the Old Testament prophets like the back of their hand. Because then you can go to Revelation and understand it and interpret it correctly. But you're going to get it totally wrong unless you know all of this. All right? All of Scripture is that way. It builds on itself. So that was just a bonus little Bible study lesson there. All later Scripture is founded on earlier Scripture. And this is a perfect example. Okay, so before we get into the next section, I've got some homework for you guys. I've got some work that you're going to be doing. Okay, it's church work. You're going to do it right here. You're not going to take it back with you. Uh, grab a pen and a scrap piece of paper. And if you don't have a scrap piece of paper, it's okay to use your hand. <laughs> and you are going to make tally marks as we go, okay? I want you to listen carefully as we go through the next several verses. And I want you to tally Every time you see a word, a key word or phrase that has to do with work or hard labor or being idle, which is, you know, the opposite of hard labor, or bricks or straw, H hard work, hard labor, idle, uh, uh, being idle, bricks or straw. Every time you, you, you see or hear one, make a little tally mark, and we're going to compare numbers. Verse 10. So the taskmaster and the foreman of the people went out and said to the people, Thus says Pharaoh, I will not give you straw. Go and get your straw yourselves, wherever you can find it, but your work will not be reduced in the least. Okay, we should be up to three tally marks. You got it? You following? I'm not going to give you the rest of the answers. That's all. <laughs> so the people were scattered throughout all the land of Egypt to gather stubble for straw, 
The taskmasters were urgent, saying, Complete your work, your daily task, each day as when there was straw. And the foremen of the people of Israel, whom Pharaoh's taskmasters had set over them, were beaten and were asked, Why have you not done all of your task of making bricks today and yesterday as in the past? Then the foremen of the people of Israel came and cried to Pharaoh, Why do you treat your servants like this? No straw is given to your servants. Yes, they, yet they said to us, make bricks, and behold, your servants are beaten. But the fault is in your own people. Notice I kept highlighting your servants. It's important. We'll come back to it. But he said, to, but he said you are idle. You are idle. That is why you say, let us go and sacrifice to the Lord. I'm sure the Pharaoh sounded just like an elementary <laughs> student. That's why I did that. Go now and work. No straw will be given to you, but you must still deliver the same number of bricks. And the foremen of the people of Israel saw that they were in trouble when they said, you shall by no means reduce your number of bricks, your daily task each day. Okay, how many tally marks? 17, 15, 34, 30. Cheater! All right, 17, 15, et cetera. She, oh, she heard the last sermon. She was in here. The, all right, my answer is 34. God, took my thunder. The answer is 34. But that's because I cheated, and I started counting back at verse 4 when this hard labor motif started. There are 34, maybe even more, different terms referring to hard labor and work and brick making. So what does that mean? If we like set it up and change it and count all the, indi are there special meanings to the words in there? I don't know, maybe, but I wouldn't dig into that unless we knew the Hebrew, the original language. Um, but the big point that I'm trying to get across here is that this is the third callback to, the cha to chapter one. When we go back there, we see the same thing, that Pharaoh giving them hard labor and brick making, but there it's only mentioned seven times. So the now, stating it 30-some times, their work has quadrupled. It has gotten so much more, uh, so much worse for them. But this is an even further callback to Genesis 1 through 3. In the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve were given purposeful work to tend the garden. But it wasn't hard work. When Adam and Eve worked to develop the garden, it glorified God. It provided them a place to live. It gave them purpose. It gave them food. And they were com uh, commended, challenged, uh, commanded to be fruitful and to multiply. But when Adam and Eve sinned, they were cast from the garden and their survival was now based on hard labor, on working the ground. And instead of it producing food like it should have, it produced thorns and thistles and then ultimately, they would die in that curse. In this Exodus account of slavery under Pharaoh, we are seeing the curse of sin fully developed. The Hebrews are enslaved to work the ground, making bricks, because bricks are made out of mud. It's the ground. But here, it's not producing food. They're producing bricks they cannot eat to produce buildings they will not live in, which give glory to Pharaoh instead of God, who is actively keeping them from being fruitful and multiplying, killing their children, as we've already seen. Under the control and slavery of Pharaoh, the Hebrews are living in the full expression of the curse of sin. Let me more formally compare the two, because I want to drive this home in the Garden of Eden, the glorification of the Lord brings fulfillment and purpose, enjoyable work, nurturing of life, the meeting of their physical needs, life-giving community, which Adam and Eve have together, fruitfulness and multiplication. In the desert of Egypt, glorification of Pharaoh brings empty purpose, soul-draining work, stealing of life and joy. Their needs are left unmet. Community that brings beatings and abuse and ultimately death and oppression. 
death and oppression as well as depression, I'm sure. Right after we hear the words out of Pharaoh's mouth, who is the Lord? We see a stark contrast, a stark definition of who the Lord is not. In the context of Pharaoh, it is so clear that God is the one who provides life and nurture and purpose and good work and rest and beneficial community and fruitfulness. And in Pharaoh, we see the antithesis of all of those things. We see the opposite of all of those things. As we move through our Exodus series, it will continue to expound on the identity of God. The chapters to come will shine more light on this creator God and who he is and what he expects from the Hebrews. And we can learn a lot about God the Father as we study through Exodus, and that's why we're going. However, but... The truth is, a greater revelation has already come than the book of Exodus. A clear picture of God has already come in the form of Jesus Christ. 2,000 years ago, God put on flesh and he came and he dwelt amongst man like he's been promising to all throughout the Old Testament. And in Jesus Christ, we see a life that perfectly showed us the character of God, the love of God, the holiness of God, the right judgment of God, the self-sacrifice nature of God, the long-suffering of God. Colossians 1, 9 says this, for God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him. All of it. Colossians 2, 9 says, for in him the whole fullness of deity dwells in bodily. John 14, 8 through 9 says this, Philip said to him, to Jesus, Lord, show us the Father and it is enough for us. And Jesus said to him, have I been with you so long and you still do not know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. We could keep going. I could list scripture after scripture talking about Jesus' equality with God, Jesus' divinity. But I'm going to do one more, and then we're going to move on. John 12, 44 through 45, it says, Jesus cried out to the crowd who was there. He cried out and said, Whoever believes in me believes not in me, but in him who sent me. And whoever sees me sees him who sent me. I have come into the world as light, so that whoever believes in me may not remain in darkness. What is the darkness? Ignorance of God. Ignorance of salvation. Condemnation. That is what the darkness is. At FCC, at First Christian Church, just like in the rest of Orthodox Christianity at large, we believe Jesus to be the full revelation of God. Because Jesus is God. We believe that eternal life is found in him and him alone because Jesus, knowing Jesus, is knowing God. We believe Jesus' words when he says, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Why? Why? Because he's God. Because Jesus is God. To believe that salvation is found in any other way or person or method means you don't believe the words of Jesus. To love Jesus, but then to think that you can have or anyone else can have a relationship with God outside of him is to contradict his very words. Acts 4.12 says, And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. No other name. The scriptures say it over and over and over. Jesus is exclusive. 
It's not my misunderstanding. It's not Christianity's misunderstanding. It's Jesus' words. You cannot believe Jesus to be truthful and good without also believing his truthful and good words. To say there is another way to God is to call Jesus a liar. He is God. He is exclusive. He is salvation. Just like the Yahweh that we will see through Exodus is God, is exclusive, is the source of salvation because they are the same. They are the same God. So who is the Lord? Jesus Christ is the Lord. I hope you believe this. I compel you to believe this. Believe Jesus' words that he says, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So now returning to our passage, chapter 5, verse 20. <coughs> verse 20. They, they who? The Jewish foreman, excuse me, <coughs> drunk that water a little wrong. They who? The Jewish foreman who just went to Pharaoh and who were beaten because the Hebrews were not meeting their quota. Those people. They met Moses and Aaron who were waiting for them as they came out from Pharaoh and they said to them, the Lord look on you and judge because you have made us stink in the sight of Pharaoh and his servants have put a sword in their hands to kill us. So after seeing this this uh, comparison between Pharaoh and God. We're not surprised, are we? Of course Pharaoh is doing this. Of course his servants are reacting this way. But the, hero, uh, the, the Hebrews are not surprised for some reason. The Hebrews are so deep in their slavery system that they don't see another option. They think this is life. They think this is just how it is. And so instead of wanting freedom, the foreman, a few verses back, are just asking for lighter burdens. Just lighten it a little bit. Make it slightly more bearable. If we backtrack a little bit more, as I highlighted, they talk about themselves and about the other Hebrews as Pharaoh's servants. They say, your servants, your servants, your servants. They think they're the property of Pharaoh still. In contrast to Moses and Aaron going, before Pharaoh and saying, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, let my people go. God thinks the Hebrew people are his. Moses and Aaron understand the Hebrew people belong to God. But the Hebrews themselves, specifically the, Pharaoh, uh, the, the foreman here, they still think themselves as Pharaoh's servants. Here's a quote from a guy named Philip Ryken, the current president of Wheaton College. And he says, the foremen called themselves your servants to Pharaoh. That shows how much power Pharaoh still held over them. They were so used to being in bondage that they could not think of themselves as anything else other than slaves. Rather than seeking to be free, they went back to renegotiate the terms of their captivity. I love the way he puts that. They went back to renegotiate the terms of their captivity. But don't mentally give the, the foreman too rough of a time because I'm a foreman and you're a foreman. This is talking about us. Let me continue with, with Philip Reichen's quote here. If we are mastered by sin, it is no use asking Satan to set us free. Or let me add, if I can, it's no use to either ask God to, um, uh, to allow us to stay in our sin, but just lessen the burden on the other side of that coin. It is no use asking Satan to set us free. Sin is not our friend, but our enemy. Nor is there any possibility that somehow we will figure out our own way to escape from sin. It takes divine power to release someone from Satan's service. This was obviously true for the Israelites. The story of bricks without straw portrays Pharaoh as an impossible man whose heart was hardened beyond the power of any human being to change it. The only force 
capable of comp- compelling him to let God's people go, own hand was God's own hand. And then let me read this last line to you. Pay attention if you fell asleep while I was reading that long quote. Last line. In the same way, only God can deliver a sinner from sin. He alone has the power to change a sinner's heart and thus to bring freedom from sin to death. Freedom from sin and death. Without Jesus Christ, each one of us is a foreman. Each one of us is a foreman. Without Christ, each one of us are so deeply in bondage to our sin that we can't understand that it is not a lighter burden that we need. We need the total death and destruction of that sin. We need that sin and that slavery system to be killed off 100%. It is not a lighter burden that we need. It is not less consequences for our sinful decisions that we need. In closing, as we progress through the story of Exodus in these coming weeks, we will see the divine hand of God free the Hebrews from slavery, but it will not be without the complete destruction of Pharaoh and the slavery system. Our freedom from sin does not come without complete destruction of our Pharaoh and of our sin. Luckily, the good news for you is that your Pharaoh was destroyed by the cross. The power of Satan has been destroyed by what Jesus did. But now, you have to be willing to allow your sin to be completely destroyed. Not staying in the sin and just asking God to lessen the consequences. That will not work. And it will not happen. It will only get worse. In our passage today, it opened up with Pharaoh asking the question, who is the Lord? And the rest of the chapter begins to answer this question with a stark contrast with Pharaoh. Through the rest of the book of Exodus, we will see the creator God contrast himself against Pharaoh, against Egypt's gods, against the Hebrew people themselves, and make himself more clearly known. And this is just the beginning of the answer of the question, who is the Lord from the book of Exodus? But we do have a complete revelation of God in Jesus Christ now. So we're gonna wrap up with this application question. Think about this question for a few seconds. Who is your Lord? Who is your Lord? Do you believe Jesus is the full expression of God? Will you allow Jesus to rule your life and to kill the sin that enslaves you? Or do you just want to renegotiate your slavery with Pharaoh? Let's think about this for a few seconds. Friends, go this week and ask yourself that question repeatedly, every day, every hour. Who is your Lord? Who is your Lord? If you are ready to kill your sin, then come join us for Regen on Monday nights at 6.30, where we have a discipleship program, where we strive for vulnerability, where we can find freedom from our sin. Join a life group if you haven't and be vulnerable and say, this is what I'm struggling with. I need help. Seek a spiritual mentor and say the same thing. I'm struggling like this. I can't get out of it. It owns me. I need help. Seek 
godly, Christ-centered community. Be vulnerable. Confess your sin. Repent of your sin. And experience the forgiveness of Christ and new life as he kills your sin and pulls you into a fruitful, purposeful life. Let's pray together. God, all of us are in bondage to sin. And no matter how much we try to manage it ourselves, we cannot get free. We cannot lessen the consequences. We need you and your divine hand to come and kill the sin in our lives. I pray that you would move us, Holy Spirit. Come into our heart, convict us, give us the courage to be vulnerable. Give us the courage to confess. Give us the courage to chase after forgiveness, to chase after Christ-centered community because you are the only one who can do this for us, who can change us, who can save us. It is terrifying to think about confession sometimes. So I pray that you'd give us courage to do that. I pray that we would every day more and more make you our Lord, make you the Lord of our life so that we can experience more than just salvation, but we can today start experiencing freedom from sin. Thank you, God. Thank you for Jesus. Amen.